Right to a channel of like fluid. Welcome back to Frostfang. Yes, it's time for some more Nevin. And if you remember last time, we are going to go off hunting with Mr. Grumpy Horns. And that's what's going to happen next. Well, here's a day that's off to a good start. I managed to wake up all by myself at the appointed time. Well, if that's not a sign the gods are with me today, I don't know what is. Besides, this day should be noticeably less tense than yesterday. Sure, Vekad wants me to go hunting with him. Let's be honest, it'll probably come down to a walk in the woods. I'll watch him hunt something in cheer at the appropriate time. Speaking of the stag, he should be waiting for me at the north gate. I should hurry to find him before he leaves. Getting through the city is easier than yesterday. Capital or not, it's early morning. People are just starting to wake up and passes by a few. It only takes me about 15 minutes to get to the city gates. Now I just need to find my hunting companion. It's without surprise I see Vekad sitting on the side of the road, carving the wooden figurine he was already working on the day before. He's made quite a bit of progress, as I now recognise the shape of a crocodile's head. The strange thing is, the posture of this reptilian creature looks neither animal nor anthrocan. It's a kind of monstrous hybrid that one could find in the children's story. Don't even have time to address the hunter before he lifts his head in my direction, greeting me with a polite nod before carefully stowing his work of art in the small satchel hanging from his belt. And then you get here for a left. Usually it's too soon for people to enjoy their little comforts. He allows himself a smirk the hints at scorn for me as he stands up. What does he think I am? You know, I've rarely lived in one place for long. I'm used to getting up early and leaving in a hurry. Getting up early is a good start. Be able to be efficient after waking up. Dearest Beckett, I have survived huge binges followed by very short nights before our gigs even started, and I captivated the crowd despite my hangover. So it's just a little forest walk in the morning. I should be able to get through it. We are not here to walk, we're here to hunt. And the first rule of hunting is to be quiet. You must avoid scaring our prey. Vekka's insistent look is enough to make me realise our discussion ends here for now. Or is he more than happy not to talk, Mr Grumpy Horns? But so be it. I'll prove it to you that I can be quiet. Sometimes. The buck takes the lead and walks briskly. Given our size difference, I'm almost forced to run to keep up. He's obviously not planning to go easy on me. I trot over to him, feeling a tad ridiculous being stuck between walking and running. But if he thinks that'll be enough to shut me up, he's fooling himself. We're not in the woods yet. I doubt I'll scare anything away. So, that figurine you're carving, what exactly is it supposed to represent? Hmm? Ah, the crocodile looking thing? I don't know. Something I see in my dreams. You can call that thing a dream. Oh, so you're made like everyone else after all. Even you need sleep. I allow myself a playful smile. The hunter just shakes his head with a growl. I guess you still think I'm a monster of what I did. I have no regrets. They had their chance to settle the situation peacefully. For a moment I slow down, surprised by the turn this discussion is taking. It's not exactly what I meant. You're not the first person to kill to protect me. I don't see you as a monster for it. To be quite honest, I was surprised by how easy it was for you. I would never blame you for that. It's not easy. It's never easy. I just make it look like it is. First, you convince yourself the person you're about to kill doesn't deserve to live. You tell yourself the world would be better off without them. The stag's voice hardens and he turns a cold gaze on me. I suddenly feel like I'm not talking to the same person. All emotions seem to have left this shell, leaving it full of emptiness. And then you think about all the other anthracans who died because no one had the balls to kill these guys. You tell yourself every predator must know the fate for prey sooner or later. 
I can barely swallow my saliva when I see Vekka's expression. I once again feel like a prey, prey facing its predator, where I struggle as much as I can to keep my muscles from tetanizing. I can't assume to understand what you're going through. I can only appreciate what you've done for me. As long as there are people like you out there, I guess I'll feel... safe? The hunter's eyes seem to come to life again, and he shakes his head, Watch me as if I'd said something stupid. You shouldn't. The only one who can guarantee your safety is yourself. Maybe you've been relying on others until now, but I can only encourage you to become independent. That's why I'm going to teach you to hunt. This time I stopped completely and crossed my arms, tapping my paw on the ground. When exactly was he planning to tell me this? I didn't plan to hunt. I planned to watch you hunt. I'm a herbivore. I don't need to learn that. I never said I would let you watch. I said I'd take you with me. Do you really think you're here to sniff flowers and pick mushrooms? You're too used to having it easy, little prey. Beckard grins, obviously struggling out to outright laugh at me. I feel a little insulted. He's not completely wrong. We should have seen it coming. I'm not happy about it, though, but... I gave my approval yesterday. All I had to do was ask for details then. Well, teach me, I guess. Okay, okay, I can try. But I'm unable to hurt a fly, so a real prey. And besides, you only have one bow, and I doubt I'll be able to handle it, considering the size of this thing. I'll help you, don't worry about that. The hunter pauses for a moment, and then, seeing my worried look, immediately resumes with an air both reassuring and full of authority. And no. There's no point in making any more excuses. You'll have to learn to survive on your own. I'm not going to hunt for you every time you need a new string. It's easier to teach you the ropes. Now it's my turn to sigh heavily and keep quiet. I don't really want to kill an animal. That's usually the job of predators. The truth is, Vekad isn't a predator either. And yet he is a royal hunter. At least the stag caught what he wanted. No one talks anymore. And it probably suits him since the vegetation's getting thicker and thicker around us. He'd have asked me to keep quiet so as not to scare the prey away anyway. I'm enjoying the sound of the wind in the branches and the birds singing while I can. Maybe I'll find some inspiration in nature. Who knows? Well, it's not as interesting as epic battles or steamy romances when it comes to storytelling, but it speaks to other, deeper emotions. I suddenly hear a rustling in the grass. Seems the Vekat's here is not as sharp as mine since he continues walking. Without waiting, I grab his arm and point in the direction of the noise before putting a finger in front of my lips. He understands immediately and grabs his bow before lifting his muzzle into the air. He sniffs. And then he ducks and moves forward into the cover of the thickets, skirting around the direction I pointed. I follow him closely without crouching since I'm practically his size now. The hunter eventually positions himself on a high point, which we can see the source of the noise. It's... a stag. I glance towards Vekard, but he doesn't seem to have the same hesitation as I do. Is he really hunting his own species? The animal is too busy grazing to notice us, and obviously he doesn't sense us either. Without waiting, my hunting partner puts the bow between my fingers, then whispers in my ears. I'll help you pull the string. You are right-handed, so hold the bow in your left paw, the string in your right, and aim with your right eye. I'll correct your posture. What, just like that? Right now? Do I only get five minutes of prep time, a little warm-up, or even a demonstration? Becca gives me an impatient look and I tighten my paws on the weapon, so it's clearly not the time to question. Feeling the adrenaline pumping through me, I try to get into what feels like the most natural position to shoot. Beckard's paws come to rest on my right shoulder and left hip, position me, then he notches the arrow. It could almost be a romantic moment if the stag wasn't so rough with me. I feel like I'm being shaken like a plum tree in the middle of a harvest season. The warmth of the hunter's breath against the back of my neck sends shivers of excitement down my spine. This reminds me of my lessons with Irwin, but I must say they were considerably more enjoyable. And I doubt Beckard and I would end to stay in the same bed. My mental wanderings come to an end when I feel the rope tighten. I'm obviously not the one who manages to pull it. The damn weapon is impossible to handle. The buck has placed his paw under mine on the bow's handle, and I can feel his body tense up from the effort. Strange. I feel like he's much more muscular than he looks. Although the moment is pleasant, the position is not the most comfortable. It feels like a real stone wall against my back. 
Get a move your ears or the string will cut them. And put the tip of the arrow slightly above your target. What to do? Under the hunter's guidance, I'm careful not to let anything stick out while correcting my aim. That's when he releases the string. I can feel the gust caused by all this tension suddenly release, and the projectile goes at full speed into the animal's side, with so much power that only the deflection protrudes. For a moment I'm torn between the excitement of having succeeded, and the fact that I've killed an animal for the first time. But by some divine intervention, the animal is still standing. He bolts immediately after the initial surprise while I stand there, my body shaken with the adrenaline of the moment, yet not knowing what to do. I barely have time to understand what I have to do when Vekad has already launched himself after the beast. I shake my head and try to follow him, but his size and the fact he's used to moving through the thickets ensure that I lose him very quickly. Only my ears can guide me now. I follow the sound of cracking branches and leap as quickly as I can to keep up, but eventually only silence remains. Vekad, where are you? I realize how quickly the quiet of nature that I found poetic and inspiring until now could become oppressive. I don't know what kind of predators these forests might harbour, but I'm just a rabbit. No, Eric, have some balls, damn it. You're not a child. Everyone's been telling you to toughen up since you got here, so you better show them what you're made of. I grab the grip of my raping, pull it out of its scabbard, then turn my head to try and catch any sound that might come up. Shit, not even a bird. Eric, over here! Oh fuck, he scared me. I turn to the source of the noise. It doesn't seem to be very far. I keep talking, I'm coming. I resheathe and take a breath before moving towards Vekad's voice, who shouts intermittently until I find him kneeling beside the animal, which is now quite dead. The stag smiles at me. That simple expression seems more shocking to me than seeing the carcass of an animal of the same species as him lying on the ground. A nice shot for a first time. But look, we got unexpected help. He pulls the prey's head by its antlers, revealing three tears in the neck. Blood drips from them to form a small stream that gets lost among the dead leaves. Well, Snow Leopard did this. I had to chase it away. Well, I suppose I'd have to share with a weakling, but the wild animals get involved. Looking up at Vekka, I expect his usual grumpy look. But he's still smiling. Will that be teasing? No, I'm going to pass up the opportunity. I need to answer him with a quip too. Are you sure you're Vekhead? I was planning to spend my day with a rather grumpy stag. You didn't happen to see him in the bushes, did you? Well, I did find a stag, I guess. Didn't have time to chat with it, see if he's grumpy, though. The hunter chuckles and pats the corpse. It's a little icky, but a bit of dark humour doesn't hurt after all that tension. It's my turn to take a look at the dead buck. It's disturbing to see Vekhead behaving so nonchalantly with it. I don't understand... Isn't this supposed to be taboo for you? I mean, I'm not judging you. It just surprises me. I point to the carcass of his prey to make Vakad understand what I'm talking about. He seems to think for a moment before struggling with a puzzled look on his face. Hi, I killed two bandits. I'm a hero. I killed an animal and suddenly I should feel bad about it. Oh, it's not so much a kill of an animal that seems strange to me. It's just that killing an animal that looks like you... I could kill an anthracon of my own kind and not feel bad about it, you know? Well, let's say it's... a different moral, for sure. I think Vekard picks up on my concern, since he looks embarrassed and rubs the back of his head with his paw still covered in blood. Oh, yeah. I know what you mean, I think. I know it's usually frowned upon to do that. After all, it could have been me. The stag lowers his eyes, plunging his gaze into the now lifeless eyes of his animal counterpart. That said, I don't think that sharing the same species make us close to each other. I believe the gods did more than give us our intelligence. I don't know if I explain it very well. Still, trip surprises me more and more. I didn't expect to be discussing theology with a grumpy hunter deep in the woods in front of a dead buck. I think I understand. But you know, we'd better settle down somewhere you'll want to have a discussion about this kind of subject. The place isn't really optimal for that. He just nods for grabbing his game to put it on his shoulder, carrying it like it weighs nothing. Then he motions for me to follow him. I know a nice place. Come on. After a good half hour walking, my paws are hurting and I'm struggling not to grumble too much. After all, this is my punishment for breaking Aket's loot. 
Sort of. Besides, he gives me a better understanding of Eckhead. He seems to open up a lot easier when he's in his element. Eventually, we come face to face with a rocky hill that Eckhead begins to climb with ease. Oh. oh, no. Why do we have to climb? I hate it. Well, Herrick, focus. And inhale. It's okay, it's just a few rocks. It's not like he's asking you to climb a ladder. A ladder, now that would be a good reason to panic. Now, exhale. I sigh, and obviously the deer manages to hear it and sneers as he reaches my paw. A tire already? I seem to give him a jaded look for grabbing his forearm. He pulls me along effortlessly, even propelling me over him. Eh, easy there. Not so fast and not so high. You should keep up with me if you don't want to be tossed over around like that. And stop complaining or I'll carry on my shoulder right next to our prey. The nausea rises in my head just at the thought of being treated like that. But I quickly pull myself together so I don't suffer that fate. Even get a head start by climbing the small hill without looking back. Knowing full well the dizziness will go to my head if I do. The sooner I get to the top, the sooner this whole thing will be over and I'll be back at a reasonable height. Once at the top, though, I'm speechless for a while. The view is magnificent. The rock on which I'm perched offers a splendid panorama over a frozen lake below. This one glistens in the sunlight, acting as a gigantic natural mirror. As long as I don't look directly below me and ignore the emptiness, this place is really a little wonder. While I'm busy contemplating the view, Vekka joins me and cuts off any sense of awe by dropping the animal's corpse. The more time I spend here, the more I realise that the romanticism of my songs will have trouble getting through to this audience. So, what do you think of the view? It's really, really beautiful. But can we have looked at it from a little lower? I'm having trouble with the altitude and all that. Are they afraid of heights too? I groan for dropping to the ground, just so I don't get dizzy anymore. I already got the talk about my physical weakness the day before. No way I'll listen to that again. Let's just change the subject if you don't mind. You were telling me about the gods earlier, and that's a very interesting discussion. And as usual, I'm shown incredible talent for subtly diverting the conversation. Ah, looks like I hit a nerve. I'm fine with changing the topic. The hunter grabs the bone handle of his knife and begins to skin the beast before my eyes. I can only look away. It's far too strange to watch him cutting up another stag. Not to mention that it's not exactly the most pleasant sight. The noise is more than enough to make me shiver. Yuck. What makes you think we're more than intelligent animals, then? Uh, ability to kill. Some people think it's an animal instinct, that it's normal for predators. I'm living proof that it's not limited to them. So my question is, did the gods give me this ability, or does it come with intelligence? Did they give us the ability to choose our path by making us capable of deep thoughts? You know what it's like to be a herbivore, a prey. You know how I can feel. Isn't that just an excuse not to change, to tell ourselves the gods made us this way? I know what it's like, but doesn't mean I want to kill others. Besides, I have instincts that rabbits generally have, so... I'm not convinced I have a choice in the path I want to follow. Although, thinking about it, my training yesterday proved to me that it's possible to go against my nature. Male Bjorn helped me break free from those constraints, if only temporarily. By the way, speaking of him, a change of subject is going to seem a bit abrupt, but something intrigues me. Now go ahead. Anyway, we have time to spare. There's still some cutting to do. Lovely. But let's say I don't understand the interest you and the prince have in me. Am I missing something? Yeah, it's true he invited you in his little sparring session. Well, I can't speak for the prince, but as far as I'm concerned, it's more curiosity than anything else. Besides, among all the candidates of the contest, you're the one who annoys me the least for now. I guess that's a compliment coming from Becker. Sort of. I smile and tilt my head, equally curious to hear more about his opinion of me. I don't get too confident. Between that annoying diva and the colourful cunt with the broom up his ass, it's not hard to be tolerable. Oh, I see you've met Sven. It's in his nature to be unpleasant, don't worry about him. It's in my nature too. Doesn't mean I piss everyone off. For once, a hunter's grievances aren't directed at me, and I don't intend to complain about it. Besides, if you win, I won't be the only commoner with an important position in the castle anymore. 
I like that. So I now have to suffer the crazy whims of the nobles, which means I won't waste my time with them anymore. Oh, and what kind of crazy whim should I expect exactly? Oh, if only you knew. The other day, King Lux told me the Mekardian diplomat wanted me to hunt a mink and bring back its fur. And do you know what he did with it when I brought it back? No, but please, go on. He used it to wipe his ass. Ah, I can tell you Lusk and I were pretty damn surprised when we heard about this. I widen my eyes and start to giggle. Fekai joins me and tries to keep his composure or resuming his story. A whole fucking day of hunting to find something to clean his ass. It's a good thing the king quickly put him in his place or I'd have to do this every day. Ah, so you still tolerate the kings? I thought you were annoyed by all the nobility. Eh, they're noble without really being noble. They treat me like an equal. So yes, they are special, but not in a bad way. Let's just say they are bearable, like you, f for now. I think I see what you mean. After my training with the prince, I can safely say he is... unpredictable. Mm -hmm. He has a lot to prove. It's not easy to follow the path of his adoptive fathers. Two successful warlords. Something tells me he's going to want his big moment too. You should be careful around him. I raise my eyebrows, questioning Verkad with a look as I try to figure out what he knows about the bear. Be careful. I doubt he's dangerous. Well, not to me anyway. He's pretty good-natured and not stupid in what I've seen of him. Oh, I don't doubt it. But he's got ambition, power and a pretty tough opposition in front of him. He's going to want to prove something sooner or later. I shrug, not sure what to make of it. Clearly the bear can be a bit of an asshole, but he's also shown his good side. However, I realise something rather strange. You talk a lot about the others, but who exactly is Vekad? The star grimaces and gives a good stab to slice cleanly through one of his game's legs. Vekad is nobody. Always so dramatic, that one. I rest my elbows on my knees and put my chin on my paws to better observe him. Lander looks up for a moment and seems puzzled by my sudden interest in him. Well, it's true. Even I have no idea who the fuck I am. For a moment, I think the buck is making a joke while keeping a perfectly serious look on his face. But he grunts when he sees that I'm waiting for the punchline. I don't remember anything. I don't even know how I got here. All I know is I'm good at what I do. Oh, so that's why he's so focused on the whole hunting thing. It's sad to think, but maybe the only thing he has left from his past. Sorry, I didn't mean to... Eh, shut up. I think that hurts me. You don't know me well enough. Yeah, starts folding the skin. It'll keep you busy. The stag throws the bloody skin at me and I hold back a grimace as I comply. I want to take back absolutely everything I was thinking this morning. This day is clearly no better than yesterday. You know, I'm grateful for you for showing me all this, and I figured I could return the favour in my own way. Vekad obviously doubts my ability to teach him anything, given the judgmental look he gives me. Eric, it's time to show what you're made of. I can't teach you how to be likeable, but, you know, I have a couple of techniques to make sociability within your grasp. I take a mocking look as I say this, which draws a chuckle from the hunter. This is a lost course. I don't need to be social because I don't care what other people think of me. Oh, come on. Give me a chance to do something for you with my many talents. For a moment, I think back to Melvior and the way he explained things to me through music. Could I do the same thing with Vekad and hunting? You know, there are many predators that hunt in packs, so sociability is also useful for you. That's because they're not good enough to hunt alone. Ugh, I wasn't talking about hunting literally. I don't know. Don't you want to settle down? You could find love or even just have someone by your side for other reasons than hunting. What other reasons? I have the good reflex to slap my forehead at Vekad's complete innocence of what I'm trying to explain to him. Naturally, all the brothers on the skin I was folding come squirting all over my muzzle. I let out a squeal of disgust and gather as many leaves as I can to rub my face. I hear a small laugh coming from Fekhead. At least my misery is amusing to others. I guess that's better than nothing. Okay, I'll give you that. Can we find a hunt with someone else? That wasn't really the message. It's a start, I guess. The stag begins to gut the carcass, scavenging what he needs and throwing away the rest. He empties the bowels in front of me, which makes me gag from both the smell and the sound. 
I really picked the worst time to discuss romance and other aspects of being in a relationship. Are you going to tell me you have really have no other need than to hunt? I eat and sleep like everyone else. Nothing exciting. If he keeps this up, he's really going to make me say it out loud. Not that I mind, but it's so obvious they won't occur to me that he's avoided the subject of that meaning to. You know, when two people really, really like each other, they... Ah, yeah, they fuck, sure. About time. So, let me get this right. When you have to leave people alone, you're intrusive. When they need explanations, you beat around the bush. I must say, it's kind of fun trying to get you to guess that. I'm surprised it didn't occur to you sooner. Besides, I can't imagine you're not successful in this area. I'm not really looking for it, though. It'll come when it comes. Well, if you want, I'm sure I can help you hunt, then. I have to emphasize the word this time. I wiggle my eyebrows at him with a lecherous look. Hopefully that will be enough to make him understand the metaphor this time. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. But for now... The hunter stuffs the offal into a bag, leaving the rest of the corpse there. Without a word, he runs down the slope. It's all so abrupt when he comes to end in the discussion. Hey, wait for me. I have short legs. I try to keep up. Last moment, I realize how high up I am and suddenly get dizzy. Oh, crap. I grab something, Eric, and quickly. My momentum combined with the dizziness causes me to stumble right towards the buck. I can only catch myself on his antlers. So, here I am, hanging up this small, embarrassed smile on my face as Vekat stares at me with a jaded look. I hope that's not your hunting technique. He sneers and finally grabs me by the hips to put me on the ground before continuing on his way with an indifferent air. I know you won't believe me, it was purely accidental. It was as if you had wanted to hunt, hmm? If you want to play hard to get, then can return the favour. I'm not an easy rap and I certainly don't need teenage flirting techniques. No, sir. When I want to seduce someone, know that I deploy methods that are close to art. I am a maestro of courtship. And what comes after as well. Besides, not I'm particularly repulsed by him, he's pleasant to the eye certainly, but he has a particularly bad temper and I have a promise to keep. He'd have to know how to hunt for real before he can think about hunting me. This whole metaphor is getting all tangled, but if it makes you feel any better, it wasn't a pickup attempt. Sure. I can feel all Vekka's perplexity in his voice, so much so I don't even need to see his face to understand he doesn't believe me. I sigh heavily and shake my head. What's the point of trying to convince him otherwise anyway? This guy is as stubborn as a mule. You believe what you want if it flatters your ego. Talk too much. I'm hungry. No time to think about anything else. What the fuck? Why does that bother me? It's not like I fell on him on purpose. It's all the more annoying because Vekka doesn't seem at all embarrassed or even amused by the situation. He just goes about his days as if nothing happened. I feel like a kid pouting in his corner. Again, only the sounds of nature break this silent and monotonous stroll. I can only sigh with relief as I see the machicolations of the capital's towers in the distance. Really hope I'll have time to catch a breath today. Once we get back to the castle, Vec had nods to me or dropping his messy bags. It wasn't bad for the first time. You still have to learn, and you will. Besides, the discussion wasn't pleasant either. I'm stunned for a moment, then I smile frankly at him. He compliments half-heartedly, but he compliments nonetheless. I'm not the only one who starts to learn, but I can see efforts are made. Thank you for the trip, Mr. Grumpy Horns. Ah, finally. He raises his eyes to the sky. It's been a while since he did that. Instead of talking nonsense, take that. Then the rummages through his belongings and pulls out a string which he stuffs into a small purse for handing to me. I'll teach you how to make strings yourself, but for now, just take it. No way to look forward to spending more time with him or to regret in advance the fact I'll have to handle the guts for an animal. Either way, it deserves my thanks. Sure, I'm looking forward to it. Well, thanks for this. I'll tell Aket that it's thanks to you for having loot like new. Yeah, I'm just doing my job. Go away now, I need to rest. Have a nice day. And with that friendly exchange, I hop happily back to my room. In the end, getting to know new people might be more pleasant than expected. I notice a few looks that are strange, to say the least, as I walk to the castle. Strange and not very positive. Has something on me or what? 
I look down and... Oh, fuck. It seems that working with Eckhart has quite the effect on my clothes. Great. That's the second I've come back to the castle with blood on my clothes. I'm clearly going to have a bad reputation at this rate. I need to change and wash myself properly. Not just with a few leaves this time. Which reminds me, when I was exploring the place yesterday, I saw there were hot baths in the basement. Well, I guess I could tell two birds with one stone, clean myself and relax. Hopefully I have some good company and some eye candy to look at. Despite my promise to Rago, there's nothing to stop me from indulging my desires by looking at nice looking males. Invigorated by this idea, I walk with a much quicker step up to my room to get something to wear and drop off the stained clothes. Once on the stairs, however, a sudden sound stops me. I can hear the ringing of a small bell out in the courtyard rung as vigorously as possible. Odd, I don't think I've heard that before. I was out on the streets yesterday at this time, so I guess this explains it. Maybe it's a way to wake up those who are still asleep, or maybe a way to signal the meal is ready? I'll just have to ask someone later. Right now, washing myself is a more pressing matter. The basements are heating. I think it has something to do with what heats the rest of the city. What could it be? Another question I'd have to think about asking at some point. But the baths themselves are pretty well organised. They're separated into two sections, one filled with small basins for washing up, while the other is occupied by larger pools meant for bathing. What is truly strange is the soot and burnt stone on the wall in front of the door leading to the pools. It's an odd place for a fire-related incident, I must admit. I'm guessing there's a story connected to this, and it's probably even related to Tenok now that I think about it. Given the size of his brand, he must be able to set an entire wall on fire if he wants to. That said, for I can enjoy a bath, I'm going to have to wash up a bit. I undress as quickly as I can for wrapping one of the towels hanging against the wall around my hips. Let's keep it decent, well, at least for now. Lined up against one of the walls, there are about ten small buckets filled with water, and a few soaps are also available to all. I grab one of the buckets and start wetting my face when I hear a thud from behind the door that leads to the baths. Yeah, fuck! The door swings open with a bang and a jet of flames crashes against the already ash-black wall. I feel like my hair is scorching from the heat. Within seconds I've been caught in that inferno, and all that's been left of me is a roasted rabbit. It's getting to be a few times I've now escaped that kind of situation in three days. I wonder if Frostfang will end up killing me soon. <laughs> so much the grandchildren want me to have, Rago. A few seconds later, I hear a loud splashing sound followed by a high-pitched whistle and a jet of steam escapes through the door. What in Argon's name is going on in there? I approach the door as cautiously as I can. I have no desire to get fried, but I'd really like to know what happened. Anybody there? What? Uh, Eric, what are you doing here? Tenoch? A little reassured by the presence of the lizard, I step into the room to try to see something. That's not exactly an easy task. A thick layer of steam diminishes my field of vision, and I can barely see a metre in front of me. Given the location and the fact I'm wearing a towel, I think it's pretty obvious what I'm doing here. Didn't you hear the bell? What kind of question is that? Yes, I did, but I'm having a real hard time seeing what that has to do with you almost burning my ass just now. As I reach the centre of the room, I can finally see the bath itself, and standing in the centre of it is Tenoch, completely naked. And, of course, the damn steam is blocking my view. I'm beginning to think that the gods really hate me. Didn't anyone tell you? About what? That the baths catch fire from time to time? All I hear is a sigh, and what little I can see of Tarok seems to take on an apologetic look. I shit, I guess I should have told you myself. People must have thought I did since you entered the castle with me. Tarok, I'm seriously going to need some more explanations. Uh, sorry, sorry. It's just that when the bell rings in the courtyard, it's a signal I'm coming down here to train with my brand. As you've seen, it can be dangerous rather than be in the same place as me and the water basins allow for any excess flame issues to be addressed, if needed. Indeed, that would have been useful information to have a little earlier. Now, I could have asked what the bell in question meant when it rang. But hey, if you can get all favour from the lizard by exaggerating a little, I'm not going to pass up the opportunity. No one is heard. I guess that's good enough. Now I have to admit that my fur is a bit singed. Are you going to make up for that? Tenoff gives me a surprised look for grinning as he slowly moves in my direction. Oh, I do have some ideas on how best to make it up to you. And I don't doubt for a second that you'll like it. Now we are talking. 
Really? Uh, what do you have in mind, Mr. Ambassador? He walks the edge of the pool before holding out his paw to me, obviously expecting me to grab it. I've warmed up all this water. It'd be a shame not to enjoy it. I prefer my bath cold, but if it's to enjoy such a pleasant company, I'm willing to make that sacrifice. I only spend a lot of time thinking about what I should do here. Without the slightest hesitation, I grab his paw and drop my towel. I don't know if the steam is blocking his view as much as it is mine, but even if it isn't, I've never been against making a show of myself. I feel him briefly devour me with his eyes before guiding me into the bath, allowing me to join him in the water. The latter is hot, almost the point of being unbearable. I'm willing to boil a little. In the immediate future, I have slightly more interesting concerns. I slip into the water, submerging myself and sitting on the stone bottom with just my head sticking out. Ten octaves the same in front of me, so we can look at each other. I really hope you'll enjoy that excuse. It's a good start. I expect more. Oh, Mr. Fluffy, but is demanding, I see. But I don't doubt for a second my ability to find a way to satisfy your desires. I don't need to see his face through the steam to understand exactly what he implies. And the gods, I might should find someone even less subtle than me. And for you have a I'm a master at this little game. I'm absolutely in the mood to give him a little lesson. I let myself slide as much as possible into the bottom of the pool, or stretching my legs in front of me, accidentally rubbing them against Tenoch's. Well, if you really want to make up for a little more, I have my own idea of an excuse. I feel his leg quiver under my touch, while the grin I see through the steam seems to widen even more. Oh, really? And what is this wonderful little idea, hmm? I run my paw up his leg, gently caressing his thigh before straighten up as if nothing happened. Well, I must confess being very curious about what happened to you before I arrived. Uh, do you mind if I ask you some questions? There's a brief moment of silence. For a second I wonder if I pushed the envelope a little too far. Tenoch is clearly not into protocol and all that, but he's still a noble after all. Fortunately of me, the ambassador bursts out laughing a few seconds later. Hey, you little tempter. I guess I deserve that, though. I appreciate the advantage, and I know we bards have a reputation. You didn't think it would be that simple, did you? You already told me you didn't want an easy win, after all. No one can dream. But I don't mind. Your resistance only makes the reward more exciting. And who says there will be a reward? Oh, I know there will be. Sir, you are full of confidence, all I can see. Not that I don't like it, quite the opposite. Oh, let's calm down, Eric. I know the water and steam hide a lot of things. Let's not take unnecessary risks. So, uh, what kind of questions do you want to ask me? Hmm? Oh, yeah, right. I did say that. Probably would have been better if I had questions to ask. I think before you speak next time, Eric, come up with something fast. Uh, oh, yes. It's just that, considering the size of your brand, I didn't expect you to need to practice. You should be able to do pretty much whatever you want with fire, right? Still more complicated than that. I guess not having a brand makes you miss some information. Wait a minute. How does he know I don't have a brand? I don't exactly make it a secret, but I don't think I've ever told him. I don't remember telling you that. You're not spying on me, are you? I enjoy attention, but I have my limits. Oh, no, rest assured. You're cute, but not that cute. It's just that this morning, as a weasel spent all the time bitching about you, I was able to glean some information by listening very carefully. Sven, of course he did that. I'll have to calm him down sooner or later, if possible by humiliating him a bit in the process. That'll be deserved. You should ignore what he says. He holds a personal grudge against me. I thought so, yes. I don't know what you did to him, but he's clearly angry with you. Tenok chuckles while I roll my eyes at the ceiling. That damn weasel really decided to ruin my life. But to answer your question, that's not exactly how brands work. Actually, the fact it's so big requires more training on my part. What it offers me primarily is raw power. I'm able to create the greatest flames ever seen in Anthrican memory. But that also means if I lose control of it, I'm capable of causing enormous destruction. I'd like to point out, however, that so far I've only caught one instant. Now we expanded my brother's room when we fixed it, so I don't really see why he's still complaining about it. You set your brother's room on fire? I accidentally set fire to my brother's room, yes. On the other hand, it's all his fault. 
I just received my brand, and he spent ten minutes yelling at me under the pretext I stole his place as heir of the family. Hold on. Slow down a bit, will you? You've taken your brother's place in your family's succession. Oh, of course. I have a brand of argon, after all. I expect more explanation. Obviously the lizard is done. What could his god possibly have to do with this whole situation? A tenoff. Yes. Can you elaborate? Yeah. I keep forgetting your kingdom functions differently. I'm sorry, it's a bit long to explain, though. I might as well start at the beginning. Do you know the differences between an anthracon of your kind and a lizard? The scales? I guess I should have seen it come in. I have a hard time not making jokes when this is obviously offered. It's not the only type of hard time you're going through right now, is it? Again, I roll my eyes. Does he ever stop? Keep your own hardness where it belongs, Ambassador, and go on with your explanation. Hehe, <laughs> I'll try to make an effort. More seriously, the difference between us is our origin. Although we're both Anthracans, our ancestors differ. What do you mean? Your ancestors were simple animals, beasts without an advanced intellect, on which the gods put their brands, making them conscious. Our ancestors are, however, quite different. They aren't mere animals. They were once the masters of fire and sky. We lizards are the children of dragons. His voice rings with pride and a touch of arrogance. Because, of course, Mr. Ambassador must have better ancestors than everyone else. I thought dragons were just a legend. Just because something disappeared doesn't mean it never existed. You see, dragons are the first creations of the gods. The oldest creatures Tesla has ever known. And like animals, they are already intelligent and even capable of using magic without a brand. Alas, they're also proud and arrogant. How surprising. Tenoch's ancestors, proud and arrogant? I would never have guessed. It's basically impossible to attribute this personality traits to him. Not. So much so that one day they tried to defy the very gods. That sounds like a perfectly reasonable idea. I take it everything did not go as planned. What an incredibly deductive mind. I sense a slight disapproval in his voice. It sounds like Tenok doesn't take too kindly to criticism of alleged ancestors. I better remember that. He's in the jury, after all. As punishment for their attempted rebellion, the gods tore the wings off the dragons and removed their ability to use magic without a brand. And so we were born. I must admit I've never heard this story. Does this legend come from the Empire? It is not a legend. It is history. The history of my blood and my country. Sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. It's just that here, dragons are seen as monsters made up for the tales and legends we tell children. Ah, don't worry. It takes more than that to upset me. But it's true that I love the Empire and its history. We've accomplished so many great things, you can't deny the existence of these achievements. Like conquering half the continent. I mean, at least, unlike Mechad, you don't enslave your enemies, I guess. Well, that's all very nice. Brisson, explain to me how you took your brother's place in succession. That's fairly simple to explain. If you determine your heirs by whoever is the eldest child in the family, we determine ours based on their brands. The closer it brings us to a real dragon, the higher up the line of succession we are. And of course, the best possible brand is... He spreads his arms, and for a brief moment I can see an orange glow behind him as well as under the water, where his tail is. Two flames then shoot out from his back, briefly taking the form of bat wings for disappearing. Argon's brand. I gasp at the sight of such a feat of power. I must admit that he knows how to be impressive when he wants to. So, Hualpa wasn't the happiest when I received my brand. Hualpa is your brother, right? My older brother, yes. Actually, the youngest in my whole family. Oh, and how big is your family? There's my mother and father, of course, his three concubines, my three brothers and my four sisters, plus half a dozen nephews and nieces. And that's only close family. And then people bring up the reproduction rate of rabbits. At least I'm an only child. So, if I get it right, you're now in charge of this whole family, just because of your brand? Exactly. But I'm going to make sure I show them I deserve it, that it's not just my luck that I won this place. I suppose Walford didn't take it well. Were you able to reconcile? Tenoff's expression darkens for a brief moment. Uh, not really. I believe he accepts my new position. He just doesn't appreciate what happened. And I think he hates me. 
That'd also be a funny coincidence. We're both hated by someone who feels we stole their spot. At least as far as I'm concerned, he's not a family member. Sorry about that. Well, you can't please everyone, I guess. And he'll get over it eventually. I guess that's one way to look at it. It's not really something I have an experience with, after all. I don't have chit-chat about me. I have to admit I'm also curious about a little bunny here. Seriously, even him? I have other characteristics than my size. I'm afraid my story's far less interesting than that of a mighty foreign ambassador. He has something to tell, but since you asked about my family, you can't blame me for asking about yours, I suppose. This might be shorter than the whole dragon thing. I'm all that's left of my family. Oh, Eric, I'm sorry. Why? Not like you had anything to do with it. Besides, it's been a while. I never even knew my parents. I heard they were good people. That's it. Which didn't stop my asshole of a father from taking off and never coming back when I was two. It was my grandfather who raised me and made me the amazing rabbit you see before your very eyes. I lean as far as I can without dipping my snout directly into the water, mimicking a bow. At least I get a little chuckle this time. It's a reassurance to see I'm able to entertain the ability to Kazar, at least. I'd say it didn't do too bad a job. A few things to improve, but nothing essential. But you said you're all that's left of your family, so I guess... Yeah, he died when I was 16. That's why I decided that, since nothing was tying me into my hole in the mountains anymore, it was time for me to explore the world a bit. And I'd said it didn't do too badly. Look at me, sharing a bath with the ambassador of the Kazal Empire in the royal palace of Frostfang. There, there, there. Perfect. A nice little story. Just sad enough for him not to ask questions, a bit of humour to divert attention. This way I'm sure no one will ask me why I really left. You know, you could be in a much better situation if you finally agreed to share something other than a bath with said ambassador. Perfect. A much less risky subject, one I'm much more comfortable with. Mm hmm. Tempting, really. But I would hate to risk a diplomatic incident. After all, how do you know what a nobleman's reaction will be when he realises he's not as skilled as his partner? I'd be careful not to overestimate yourself, Fluffy Butt. I also have quite a bit of experience in this domain. A tenoch, my dear. There are two things in life I have mastered perfectly. The first is singing. The second is fucking. You wouldn't stand a chance. Oh, is that a challenge? Because I'm absolutely up for it. His tail slowly comes a wrap around my ankle. Moving up my leg, which is far from unpleasant. Rigo, I really appreciate you, I do. But right now I'd strangle you for that damn promise you want me to keep. Again, it's really tempting. Unfortunately, I already have my afternoon taken. And you probably know better than anyone that good things take time to come. After all, it'd be a shame to rush and finish too quickly, right? I stick my tongue out at him before pulling my leg back, freeing it from the grip of his tail. He keeps this up, promise or not, I don't think I'll be able to hold back much longer. Indeed. But I know to be as patient as necessary. We'll finish what we've started, eventually. Just wait until the contest is over, then we can get down to business, you and me. We spend the next few minutes just relaxing in the water, exchanging pleasantries. It's nice to be able to let loose a little like that. After the last few days, it's really welcome. The steam is disappearing as we talk, and I can feel the water starting to cool down slightly as well. I think that's a sign it's time for me to get out. Now it wouldn't really be fun to just get into the water. It's never a little fun at ten off expense. So many possibilities, though. It's hard to pick just one. What to do? Might as well continue what I started. Let the poor lizard imagine what I look like down there without giving him anything more than necessary. I very much appreciate the hot bath and the conversation, but I'm afraid I have to go. However, I do have a small favour to ask of you. It's nothing, I'm sure you won't mind. Anything you want. Perfect. You see, we are among civilised people here. I'd be very upset to impose my nudity on a noble, even more so the Ambassador of Kazal. Could you just cover your eyes, please? I assure you, I have no problem with your nudity. Plus, I lean in, giving him a look full of sexual innuendo. It'd be a shame to small the surprise for the big day, don't you think? I have the satisfaction of seeing a brief moment of surprise on his face before he lets out a sigh, lifting his paw to place it in front of his eyes. 
I guess I can't do anything against an argument like that, and I promise not to cheat. He laughs, amused. I do the same as I step out of the pool, wrapping a towel around my hips. You can open your eyes. I'm decent again. What a shame. Are you sure I don't get a little peek? Patience, my dear, patience. Everything comes to him who knows how to wait. I head towards the exit by exaggerating my hips way, all smiles. Shall we meet again later? I'm going to rehearse a bit with Arquette right now. It will be a pleasure. I step out of the bathing room, mentally preparing myself for the twenty minutes it'll take to dry my fur. I'm not sure about the last arrangement. Maybe just turn it up a bit? My voice is not very deep. That's what you call an informed attribute. Practice with Arquette went as well as could be expected, considering we never played together before. You can't expect perfection the first time around, after all, especially considering we come from two totally different nations when it comes to musical tastes. But despite that, I know we are really good. And we'll get even better by the time the competition starts. I don't see who could possibly compete with us. Anyway, I'll see you tomorrow. Right now I'm hungry. I haven't eaten anything since this morning. I have to admit I wouldn't mind a little something to eat too. I suppose the kitchens are open. It better be the case. I'd kill for a salad right now. We get out of the room and take some time to stretch. While I love to sing, spending several hours rehearsing and doing the same things over and over can be time consuming. But if it helps me win, it's more than worth it. I'm really glad you offered to team up. I've never really had a partner. It's quite nice, I must say. You were performing by yourself at your general's house, right? Oh, that's right. In Mecca, we see music more as a background thing. Something to give normal an atmosphere to the discussions. It's rare that we really sing and dance during our receptions. Except when it's a ball specifically for that, then it's customary to hire well-known artists. Yeah, well, your parties sound like a ball. Well, no offence. He raises his talons in front of his beak to hide a small laugh. Yeah, that's cute. I guess you're not entirely wrong. You two seem to have a hard time staying calm compared to the Macadians, that's for sure. And you haven't seen anything yet. Wait until you get to your first party. Then we'll have some real fun. Oh, I don't know if this is a good idea. I don't handle alcohol very well. All the more reason to participate. You can relax a bit this way. He looks away, flushing slightly. I don't know if he remembers the last time he was drunk or if the thought of being drunk for the first time makes him react that way. But one thing is for sure now. I definitely need to get this bird drunk. When we finally get to the kitchens, I'm trying to see that we're not the only ones who want to eat at this hour. Gilly and Tevekad are also there, and already taken something to fill their plates. To my surprise, the panther always wears his metal mask even when he eats. I know he's probably from the a good bodyguard should always be ready school, but still. Does he sleep with that thing on his face too? I part ways with Akhet briefly, leaving him to rummage through the carnivorous options of what's been prepared while I search for vegetarian dishes. Not that I couldn't eat meat if I wanted to. We've evolved from our animal ancestors and are able to eat whatever we want now. It's just that I find it... Well, to be honest, they're right disgusting. I'm not the only one. There are very few herbivores who voluntarily eat meat. Taking my sudden burst of curiosity, I glance in the direction of Vekad's plate. If anyone must be fond of meat among herbivores, it must be him. I'm always surprised to see him eating a simple little salad. Looks like he hasn't adopted the entirety of a hunter's habits. Seems to have caught my inquisitive look, though. Aren't you looking at prey? Oh, nothing, nothing. I was lost in my thoughts, that's all. Hmm, don't do that, aren't you? No one likes a nosy brat. Sorry, but I'm extremely likeable no matter how nosy I am. I quickly finish filling my plate before coming to sit across from Vekard, motioning for Akhet to sit next to me. You don't mind if I sit here? If I tell you yes, will you leave? Mm-hmm. Nah. So why do you ask? To be nice, you should try it sometime, dear. Vekard simply rolls his eyes as the only response. Given the number of times this happens in my presence, I'm becoming more and more convinced this is his way of saying he likes me. Akhet finally arrives to sit by my side, nodding politely to Vekad. Have a nice meal, Lord Vekad. Uh, just Vekad. Well, I'm the Lord. Oh, sorry, I... Have a nice meal, Vekad. A long silence follows. Great. 
These two really have a knack for killing the conversation when they want to. Luckily I have one more ace up my sleeve to try and save this dinner from absolute unbearable silence. Hey, Gillian, no reason to sit alone and sulk in your corner. Join us here. The bodyguard seems to take a second to think about it, before shrugging to come and sit next to Vekad. Nice, great, great, great. I have to admit I was expecting more resistance than that, but I'm not going to complain. They still have been full of surprises, too. My astonishment must be showing, though, because Gillian is giving me an inquisitive look. What? You look surprised? I'm going to be honest, I expected more grumpiness from you. I was ready to use all my charm to lure you here. I don't know who you think I am. I'm just like everyone else. I like to relax when I'm off duty and eat with people. It makes me feel good. Excuse me, but that's not exactly the impression you give. If you asked me before, I'd have told you you're probably the type of guy who relaxes by breaking rocks with his bare paws. Or something like that. And no offence, you make a hell of a first impression. It's hard to imagine you relaxing. I'm sure I hope I impress. That's part of my job, after all. Can I give you that? You gotta know what you do. I'm as proud of my work as you are of yours. Might as well do it professionally as possible. A grunt of approval comes from Vakat's throat. Is that a way for the two of them to compliment each other? But you're not on duty now, are you? Can you take your helmet off a little bit? I'm sure it'd help you make, make you more approachable. No. Do you never take it off? No. If these aren't detailed answers that allow me to move forward in this discussion, I don't know what is. How are you in your time? Since I've been here, I've never seen you without this thing. I don't think anyone's ever seen him without it. Don't be ridiculous. Of course I've been seen without my helmet. I've shown my face to the kings. I offer them the respect they deserve. Speaking of the kings, how come we haven't seen them yet? I wasn't expecting a personal welcome, but we should run them into them in the halls by now. They're just not here. How are the competition only three days away? If, if you don't mind me asking, where are they? Gillian lets out a long sigh. Doesn't seem to be directed at Akhet. My lords take days off from time to time, and the prince takes care of the castle in their absence. They have a secondary residence in the woods, the location of which is known only to them, the heir, and myself. This allows them, according to their own words, to release the pressure and thus be better able to rule. What can they possibly do in for a few days stranded in the woods? A familiar voice whispers right next to my ear. They fuck. A high-pitched squeal escapes my lips as I flinch in my chair. By the time I get myself together, I can see Vekad snickering softly across from me, Lackhead at my side seems to be holding back from doing the same. At least Gillian doesn't look like he's making fun of me. Tenoch! Hey there, bunny. Is this payback for what you put me through earlier? He laughs softly while Gillian sighs again. Well, Tenoch, a bit of respect would be appreciated. You are talking about our kings. What? It's like it's a secret? They're married. There's not the ton of things married couples do when they go to a cabin in the woods by themselves. And I already told you, forget about the whole lord thing. I carry my name is lordly enough. And as I've already pointed out to you as well, it'd be disrespectful to your position. Tenoch sighed for giving me an insistent look. Well, we'll really have to work on relaxing him a bit. We? What, you don't want to give me a hand? You know I'm right here and I can hear you. Tenoff turns to the panther and offers a big smile, which causes Gillian to roll his one moving eye. And when do the kings expect to return from their uh, vacation? Tomorrow, maybe. Two days at the most. And you better believe you'll know when they're there. Aeon is everything but discreet. He likes to let people know when he's here. Oh, that's my kind of king. He enjoys a good show. That's one way of looking at it, I guess. Come on, Gideon. You have to admit that Aeon tends to overdo it sometimes. His Majesty Aeon has the right to behave as he wishes. The panther then looks away as if embarrassed by what's following. But I must admit my work would be greatly simplified if my lord knew how to restrain himself from time to time. Yeah, it is. You see, it's not so difficult. Even you're able to take a jab at royalty. Tenoch starts to chuckle. I feel myself quickly joining him. I can see Akit doing the same from the corner of my eye. 
Echoes out some of his amused grunts. I can see that Gillian seems to be smiling under his helmet. Not the situation is particularly funny, but it's just nice. Be surrounded by companions like this and be able to exchange some jokes around a table. It's almost like I'm in a band again. I didn't realise how much I'd missed it. It's only been a few days. That nice moment was interrupted, however, by someone giving the series a small, cheerful taps on the table, just enough to get noticed. When I turn my head, I can see a hyena, about my age, leaning on the table with a big smile on his face. Once he's made sure he's got our attention, he points at both Aket and me. Yeah, I spent a while looking for you two. Looking for us? Why, is there a problem? Right, no, in fact it's quite the opposite. A competition coming soon, the rest have figured everyone could use a break from all this stress. So, we're having a little party. Tomorrow night in the courtyard. We're going to have a blast and keep all those nobles awake. He laughs loudly before turning to Tenoch. And no offence, my lord. As if I intend to sleep while you're out having fun. I'll party with you. He bursts out laughing, quickly joined by the hyena. Perfect. Now you two, are you join us? That depends. I have my own set of rules. Oh, really? Will there be alcohol? It won't be a party without alcohol. In that case, I'm in. And Akit will be there too. What? But I... All right, I'll be there. The falcon smiles shyly. I may finally get the chance to see him relax a bit. So you're not going to let this opportunity pass. All right, well, how you finish eating? Stop people in form. Enjoy your meal and see you tomorrow. I see you at the party. And thanks. With a fluid movement, he turns around and walks out of the room, almost hopping. Gives the impression of being a dancer with his grace. A real party. That'll do me good. I'll finally get a chance to let loose a little. Have some fun. And evaluate the competition. Because I doubt a bunch of bards could hold back from singing at an occasion like this. So I'll have some scouting to see how good they are. And I'll also try to impress them. Either way, promises to be fun. Wild gatherings rarely mean boredom. I don't think I've ever attended an impromptu party like this. Do I have to bring anything? Must be an appropriate outfit. I'm not sure I have the right attire. Interrupt Arkhead for a continue monologuing. Stop worrying. It's not anything formal. Just bring your loot and you'll be good. We'll just be there to sing, have fun and drink. And make sure we don't end the night alone in bed. Tenok bursts out laughing as I watch Arkhead go through a whole series of red gradations. I'll be honest, I don't think it's possible to blush that much. Not everyone's like you, scary ass. Some of us prefer to sleep alone. Oh, look at him pouting. I ask him along too. I'm sure we'll find a way to have fun. And you too, Gideon. You'll be there, but not for fun. An event like this is going to be an aberration in terms of security. I'll have to stay alert. Nah, not my thing. Ah, oh, let's kill. Looks like it's you and me tomorrow. He smiles, he looks at Akhet and me. I can't even return the smiles the Falcon continues to look away. Still red-faced. Can't wait to see how this turns out. Something tells me it does not like to be boring. I lay on the floor, gasping for air. It's over. I can't take it anymore. I regret all the decisions that led me to this point. By the gods, end my life. And please, try to make it quick. The only response I get is a long sigh from Gillian. He decided to drag it out, the bastard. Don't you think you're overreacting a bit? I just spent an hour running, lifting weights and bending in positions that are clearly not natural. I'm pretty sure you're trying to kill me very slowly. I'm trying to give you muscle, that's all. It won't hurt you in the long run. I'm a singer. I don't need muscle. Besides, can you imagine what I'd look like on stage my arms were the size of my thighs? Not to mention I wouldn't be able to play the cute bunny trick to seduce someone anymore force me to change my entire repertoire and that's absolutely out of the question. You can be a singer and be able to carry more than 10 kilos, you know. I glared you with any subtlety. I'm not that weak. I think. But obviously that's enough for today. I wouldn't want to wear you out when you have a party to attend. Oh, right. It's a party tonight. <laughs> I'll be able to let loose a little. It's actually very welcome right now. The last few days have been... Strange, to say the least. Gillian holds out his paw to help me up and I grab it. No more reason to lie on the floor. My diva complaints paid off. Once I'm up, I quickly dust myself off while looking back at the panther. 
So, you plan to be there too? I told you yesterday. My men and I will be there to provide security, not to participate directly in the festivities. Too bad, I'd love to see you dance. I'm sure you have the moves. I'm the only one here interested in the idea, obviously. Do you think will these people see me I'll be on at the party? His Majesty Melbion has not yet informed me whether or not he will attend the festivities, but I assume he'll show up, if only to keep an eye on what's going on. Maybe I'll get him to dance with me then. I wouldn't count on it, but I guess it's safe to try. So I have the permission of the captain of the guard to invite the Crown Prince to dance. Perfect. After this exchange, we store the training equipment in silence. I never admit to anyone, but I have to admit there's something nice about working out like this. Sure, I'm exhausted, but it's, uh, good fatigue? I think that's the word that best describes the feeling. Once I've put everything back in its place, I wait for Gillian before heading off to my room. I know I told Arquette yesterday that no fancy clothes were necessary for tonight. Doesn't mean I don't have the right to embellish myself a bit for the occasion. I'm not going all out on the outfit, but there's nothing wrong with wanting to look nice, is there? Not to mention, after the work out Gillian put me through, a little groom will be more than welcome. Maybe pull out some decent shirts. Nothing extravagant, just to look my best. Well, I made an effort. I only put on my second best shirt. You know, that's a fine demonstration of my ability to hold back. However, I still have one more thing to do before I can join the others in the courtyard. I need to take a look at my favourite bird and make sure he's not freaking out in his room. This really is his first time at the party. Something tells me it promised to be a most interesting evening. If I knock on Akhet's door, I wonder if he took my advice from the night before into account, or if he still decided to dress up in a special way. Plus, I'm really curious to see a Macadian party outfit he puts one on. However, when the door opens, I'm almost dazzled for a few seconds. I think Akhet spent time, a lot of time, polishing the gold lines under his eyes. So much so that they are now shining very nicely. Guess this is another way for him to deal with his stress. I know it's better or worse than his monologues, though. Hey, I see you're glowing today. Tell me you didn't spend all day scrubbing your lines. Well, not all day, no. I'll settle for that. Something tells me you spent more time on that I would consider reasonable. Let's not talk about the time I spent trying to perfectly brush my fur. I have a very good reason for doing all this. I need to look cute to do my job, after all. You don't think this too much, do you? I wonder what it looks like I've overdone it compared to everyone else. Nah, don't worry. Even if everyone notices you, what's the harm in that? Enjoy the attention. It's what we do. Not everyone's like you. On stage, it's one thing for people to look at me. But I'm just me. I prefer to be discreet. Oh, I hadn't thought of it that way. For me, whether I'm on stage or not, I'm basically still being myself, for the most part. I exaggerate my personality a bit from time to time, that's all. I hide where I don't want anyone to see. I think most people do, I believe. That being said, it provides a fairly simple solution to Akhet's problem. Well, in that case, just use me as a shield. If you're too many people are watching you, let me know. There's one thing I'm good at, it's getting attention. And unlike you, I love it. I give him a brief wink and have the pleasure of watching him laugh timidly. I certainly have some interest in seeing my musician at his best before we perform. I also really want Akhet to have some fun now. Considering all he had to endure to get here, he deserves it. Ready to go then? I gotta tell you, if I don't have at least a pint in my stomach before we show what we can do, I'm gonna be pissed. So, uh, you going to drink before you sing? Of course, I'm only better with a little alcohol in my blood. I can continue to look at me doubtfully as I give him my best smile. By the gods, this bird really needs to learn to relax. As we walk down the palace corridors, I begin to hear music come from the courtyard. Instinctively, I bob my head to its beat. That's my domain out there. That's what I'm best at. I want to be there. I want to sing. I want to dance. I want to get attention to be the main attraction. I want to be remembered. And will Eric be remembered by what happens at the party? Quite possibly. I've read ahead. I know what's happening next. But you'll have to wait till the next Nevin episode to find out what happens there. And that will be probably not too far away. I need to get back to this fairly soon. And what's coming up next? That will be a return to after years. And uh, while we're still up to date with Angus, we're going to be seeing what happens. Decide to 
choose Rowley. So I'll be working through Rowley's route, and that will be next weekend on the channel. It'll be nice to get back into that. It's been a while. And as always, before I leave, I want to say thank you to all my patrons and anyone who donates on Kofi. You're very much appreciated. And my top patrons are ah, Burnt Toast, Kartek, Cobas Vissa, Legacy Bucciarati, Lark Huskerton, Bastian, Ryan Hall, Tiger Cub, Edek Orval, Anubis Silverwind, Dissonance, Grizz, Spiderling, Kopi, Sindri Dragolf, Marcus, Evan King, Exac, Aaron Fox, Mohammed Al Zamil, Andy Peng, Samuto, Omar, Big Booty Judy, and Nova Starvo. Special thanks to all of them, and thanks to you for watching. Until next time when we return with After Years, bye for now. <laughs>